Hello friends, this video on Atoms part 12 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Please make sure that you have watched all the videos till part 11 before going ahead with part 12. So now let us talk about one of some of the uh, limitations in detail. So let us talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because we saw that uh, Bohr's theory contradicted Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So let us see what was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. However, I have discussed it in one of our previous lessons when we were talking about dual nature, right? So anyways, let's have a quick review. In somewhere around 1927, Heisenberg stated that it is impossible to determine simultaneously the exact position and exact momentum of an electron. So this, the name itself suggests uncertainty. That means if you have an object which is moving with some velocity b. So if you say that you know that you are able to measure the velocity accurately. So if you measure the velocity accurately, that means the position because you know the exact velocity with which the object is moving. So that means you will not be able to tell the exact position where the object is at every instant of time. And the vice versa is also true. If you say that I know the exact position of the object at a given instant of time, that means you cannot evaluate the exact velocity of that object. So position and momentum are two things which cannot be determined at the same time with complete accuracy. So it was uh, mathematically expressed as delta x it multiplied by delta p is always greater than or equal to h by 2 pi. The delta x is the uncertainty in position and delta p is the uncertainty in momentum. Now if you want to learn Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in little more detail, you can refer to the lesson on dual nature of radiation and matter. Now it rules out the existence of definite paths or trajectories of electrons and other similar particles. Therefore, in this case, I mean, as it mentions, that it doesn't talk about exact position or exact momentum. So that means it, it will not talk about definite paths of electrons because Bohr's model was talking about uh, a definite or a fixed circular path which the electron was following. But if Heisen's Berg uncertainty principle is true, then electron cannot have a definite circular path, right? Because we will not be able to define its position and momentum accurately, right? It therefore means that the precise measurements, precise statements of the position and momentum of electrons have to be replaced by the statements of probability. So we can never say that the electrons will move in this circular path and the electrons position at this point is this. So every time we have to use the word probability. That means there is a probability that electron that the electron might be at this position. Whenever you say that there is an uncertainty, that means there is a probability. If you say, for example, I'll give you a statement. It is suppose if I ask you, will you be coming to school tomorrow? There is one possibility that you will say yes. That means it is precise. You know the exact answer to the question. So if you say yes, that means there is no possibility that you will not come. It is sure that you will come. You say that no, I will not come. So that is also precise statement. Now if you say there is a probability that I might come. That means there is a possibility that you can come. There is a possibility that you cannot come. So this probability comes into picture when you are not sure of something. So Heisenberg told that we can never be sure of the exact position or the exact momentum at the same time. So therefore, whenever we talk about the position of the electrons, the motion of the electrons around the nucleus. So whatever we are talking about, whenever we are talking about the atomic structure, we are basically talking about the we are also talking about the distribution of the electrons around the nucleus, the movement of the electrons around the nucleus. So we can never use precise statements that electrons will move in this orbit, electrons will have fixed radius, electrons will have this and that. We can never use those statements. We will always have to use that there is a probability. That is the probability that the electron will be at this position is this. Probability that the electron will move with this much velocity is this. So every time there is the word probability and there is no accuracy. 
The effect of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is significant only for motion of microscopic objects and is negligible for that of macroscopic objects. Right, here we are talking about microscopic objects, right? We have spoken about all these things in uh, the lesson on dual nature. That why uh, this de Broglie's theory or Heisenberg's theory, they apply for microscopic objects and not for macroscopic objects, right? Okay, so because it, it talks about those objects which, ha which have got greater mass, uh, which have got lesser mass, but with extremely high velocities and all. Right? So, right now we are talking about atomic structure. So, we are talking about, we are dealing with the microscopic objects. So, in this case, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle plays a significant role. So, this is how Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, was, contradicting was contradicted by Bohr's theory. The next one was D. Broglie's hypothesis, which talked about the wave particle duality of matter. D. Broglie in 1924 proposed that matter like radiation should also exhibit dual behavior. So D. Broglie told that any object which we see can behave like a wave, can also behave like a particle. So every object on this earth has wave nature as well as particle nature. So this was D. Broglie's hypothesis. He told that the wavelength associated with any object of mass m moving with a velocity v is given by lambda is equal to h by mv. So he, he, he told that just as the photon has momentum as well as wavelength, the electrons should also have momentum as well as wavelength. So for de Broglie, every object, every object, no matter what, for every object, whether it is microscopic or macroscopic, every object will can behave as a wave. But now, now I mention what happens in case of macroscopic object, the mass is very large. Therefore, the wavelength associated with it becomes very small. Therefore, when the wavelength becomes very small, the wave nature is not much visible, right? Therefore, in the macroscopic world, you do not see particles behaving like waves because the wavelength associated with them is extremely small. That's what is written here. The wavelengths associated with ordinary objects are so short because of their large masses that their wave properties cannot be detected. The wavelengths associated with electrons and other subatomic particles can however be detected experimentally because their masses are extremely small. For an electron, the mass is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg, which is an extremely small mass. Therefore, the wavelength associated with the electron is not that small. It is, it can be detected experimentally. But if you look at the Bohr's theory of atomic structure, he never spoke about the wavelength associated with an electron. He spoke about the wavelength, the wavelength which he spoke about in the Rydberg's formula, that is the wavelength of the radiation which was emitted when electron jumps from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. But he never spoke about the wavelength of an electron. He never spoke about that. He always considered electrons as particles which are moving with a fixed velocity in a fixed orbital radius in circular orbits around the nucleus. Right? So that is how Bohr's theory also contradicted the wave particle duality of matter. Now we will look at D. Broglie's explanation of Bohr's postulate. So here, we, however, we saw that Bohr did not take into consideration the wave particle duality concept of de Broglie's proposal. However, de Broglie was able to explain the postulate which was given by Bohr. Which was which postulate are we talking about? The postulate which told that the angular momentum of an electron is integral multiple of h by two pi. This postulate was also explained by de Broglie in his way. So according to de Broglie, an electron which is moving in a circular orbit can be treated as a particle wave. So electron in circular orbit can be treated as a particle wave, right? So this is, let us suppose this is the elect a nucleus and this is the electron. So it says that the electron which is moving in this circular orbit can be considered as a particle wave, but it is not drawn properly. So it can be considered as a particle wave of this sort. 
So now just remember the example of the string. Let us suppose if you have a string. If you pluck the string from here, what happens? Several number of waves are formed. Many wavelengths are formed. Now out of these many wavelengths dry out because some are formed on the left, some on the right so that interference take place and they die out. So only those wavelengths survive where the net wavelength is an integral multiple of n lambda. Right? That is what was the concept of nodes when we spoke about when we talked about waves. Right? So for an electron in an orbit of radius r this is the radius r. So what is the distance that is traveled by the electron? It is 2 pi r, that is the circumference of the circle. So if this distance traveled by the electron is integral multiple of lambda, only then the wavelengths will survive. So and only those wavelengths survive where the wavelength is an integral multiple of lambda. So from this we can say 2 pi r is equal to n what is lambda according to de Broglie hypothesis lambda is equal to h by mv. So from this we can say mvr is equal to nh by 2 pi and this was the postulate which was given by Bohr. Right? So we can see that the same postulate which was given by Bohr considering electron as a particle we arrive at the same postulate considering electron as a wave. So in this case we have considered electron circular motion as a particle wave and we have also applied this logic considering the wave nature right because in case of wave it so happens that only those wavelengths survive at the nodes for which the net wavelength is an integral multiple of lambda right. So for more detail on this specific topic you can refer to the lesson on waves. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com to watch free educational videos, try free online tests, get the best quality study materials, study from the best tutors and mentors and much more. Thank you once again.